One of the critical skills that Joseph exhibits and has to learn as we move back now in the end of 46 through the middle of 47, we move into a close up on Joseph. Do you know what a slalom course is? Have you ever watched slalom skiing? Okay, there's a difference between skiing that is for jumping, which is generally down a straight ramp with the minimal number of obstacles to pick up the maximum amount of speed, and then you jump. There's also speed skiing, and then there's slalom skiing. That's what the ones with all those flags and bumps that they're moving around the obstacles. Joseph seems to have life pretty well worked out, but one of the skills that a believer needs is the ability to pivot and learn how to move with obstacles because not everything works out. Wikipedia says that uh, slalom is to zigzag between obstacles. I mention that only to say that in this particular text, Joseph had become a man who knew how to survive and how to thrive despite tremendous obstacles in his life. But he wasn't always able to navigate so well. In the early part of his story, he was hated by his own brothers. He was sloppily handled by his father. He was insensitively made an, uh, an overt favorite. And in all of that, he starts tossing out how everybody's going to now bow down and worship him from his dreams. He doesn't really understand how offensive what he said was to them. He learned by ending up in a hole, then ending up in an Ishmaelite camp, then ending up in a slavery uh, situation in Egypt. He's wrongly imprisoned. He's left to rot there. He's forgotten for years, 13 years. And through all of that, he's a man who was trained and honed and sharpened in the midst of crisis. So you can look at Joseph as a unique character in the Bible in the respect that Joseph really, aside from a little bit of obtuseness, is not really overtly sinning. He's doing right and getting wrong, doing right and getting wrong. And it's over and over and over. Now, let me say it this way. If I had to put a principle at the end of 46 and beginning of 47, it would look something like this. There are some refinements you need to learn to move around obstacles. You can do it in a big kind of dramatic way, but there are refinements to do it well. The only way you learn how to navigate trouble is be in trouble. And that's a problem. I hate that truth. It's true, and I don't like it. There is no better way to learn how to get around trouble than to go into trouble. So there are a couple of things that happen. There are lessons that come from the slalom course of trouble. And the first lesson I pick out is at the end of 46 in verses 31 and 32. We're almost at the very end of the chapter. And it says, Joseph said to his brothers, and to his father's household, I will go and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were in the land of Canaan have come near to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of the livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what's your occupation? You will say, your servants have been keepers of the livestock and of, from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, that now we may live in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is loathsome to the Egyptians. One of the things that I think he learns is Joseph is cruising into a time now where his family is going to be dumped into Egypt. He has had two lives. He's had one in the camp. Then he's had one where he alone represented himself before Pharaoh. What's about to change is his brothers will be there, his father will be there, and their reputation will now fall on him. You're, if you're an older child and you go to high school and you're partway into your high school career and you've been doing it on your own, that's different than what happens after your little brother or sister become a freshman. Now there's somebody else, and their reputation will be tagged to yours. I went through life as Rusty's little brother. So whatever he did wrong, I paid for. And whenever, if he had a problem with a teacher in the school where I went, I always got the same teacher a couple years behind him. 
This was never going to work out for me. I'm not bitter. But, my, but, but the point is that the, the, the reputation of more people follows you when they're together. So do you all see the trouble he's about to get into? He's got a problem. He understands Egypt. He's navigated Egypt for about, uh, oh, let's say 15 years. But, but they haven't, and they don't know what to say or what not to say. So it's kind of embarrassing. So he's got to school them. So the first thing I would tell you is one of the lessons of the slalom course is, is to learn what communication is acceptable. you got to learn the rules of the acceptable communication. When you get into college, there's a certain acceptable way of expressing yourself that wasn't the same as high school. When you get into a job situation, there's an acceptable way of learning to communicate that isn't the same as college. <laughs> when I went into grad school, I remember one of my professors, he uh, had a book and he said, uh, I, I want you to do uh, reading for our next class. This was a Tuesday class. We had a Thursday class. He said, I want you to do reading uh, from this text. And then somebody raised their hand and said, what chapters? And he said, the book. And he was taken back by it because he said, this is a graduate education. If I hand you the book, read the book. And somebody said, we have two days. He said, you have two days. He said, yeah, but we have life in between. This is graduate education. Read the book. I'm done talking about this. And then he moved on. And I remember that that set the tone for that class. And I remember that that particular professor, whenever he mentioned something, he just expected that you didn't just hear him. You wrote it down, you committed it to memory, and that you could spit it back to him at any time. I told you four weeks ago in class the following. And you're supposed to just know that because he said it. That was the world he lived in. And if you wanted a good grade in that class, that's the world you needed to live in. One of the first things you have to learn in every new relationship is what is the standard of communication? How do people work in this, in this relationship? By the way, when you get married, before you're married, start gauging the communication system of the other family. Because just because you guys talked about everything doesn't mean they do. Or just because you were closed-lipped about everything doesn't mean they are. Happy is the man or woman who judges the other communication system wisely. There are things you should say, must say, and should never say. So he says, tell them you're shepherds. By the way, shepherds are loathsome. I'm just telling you. Now, I think what's interesting is if you keep going on, he gets down to verses 33 and 34, and what he's doing is he's making careful preparation for tricky situations. One of the things that Joe has learned is his family's somewhat unpredictable. How many of you agree with that? His family's less than predictable. So what he tries to do is blunt it by preparing them for tricky, tricky situations. And, and he tells them, now this is exactly what you're supposed to say. I want you to note something unique about the exchange between Joe and his family. Joe knew what Pharaoh wanted to know about his family before they ever got in front of him. Jo Joe already knew. He was on that page. Joe's family was forced to immediately trust his judgment concerning what approach to take to Pharaoh. He's the only one who knows it. In effect, God used the situation to take Joe out of his place at the end of the line and put him as leader over the family. Now the family has to depend on him and they have to depend on his knowledge to keep going. Now, why is that important? Because early on, the brothers were upset about God communicating in dreams and Joe talking. Now they have to listen to Joe and they all know it. So now he emerges as a new kind of leader, an honest communicator. Now, let me just say that some problems can be solved by a little bit of preparation. And... Um, Telling people what's going to happen next helps them to adjust. It's the reason your, your dentist says, now this is going to pinch a little bit. By the way, he's lying. He means you're going to be in excruciating pain, and that's why I'm strapping you to the chair. The slalom course taught Joe that if he could prepare people, he should, because when he was unprepared, it was a lot harder. I think the other thing is you get down to the second half of verse 34, and one of the things you have to do is rely on your thoughtful understanding that you've developed through listening. 
how did Joseph come to know that Egyptians loathed shepherds? By the way, why do Egyptians loathe shepherds? There's a simple reason. It is dirty work, but you know, I got to tell you, being a Nile farmer is not exactly clean. And since you're using manure to, um, you know, fertilize, it's not that the shepherds smell worse. What's the difference between the way a shepherd and a farmer makes a living? Farmers very much about localization, right? You work the same piece of land, you guard the same piece of land. What are the enemies of a farmer? Weather and animals. So the reason they're loathsome is the sheep constantly wander off and eat their crops. So there's tension between them. There is tension when there's an op opposite economic system. By the way, I'm not just talking here. Do you know that later on, uh, God will promise them, I bring you into a good land, a land flowing with what? Milk, think shepherds, because goat's milk is what you got your milk from, goats and then camels, which by the way makes great ice cream. Um, the cows, much, much later. There are, isn't a lot of grazing in the Middle East, so you don't raise a lot of cows. There, there were cows in Egypt because they had the Nile. They always had a place to get water. But um, I bring you into a land flowing with milk is a land of shepherds. I bring you into a land flowing with what? Honey. Honey comes from agriculture. It comes from bees, which come from pollination. So I bring you into a land that has both shepherding and farming. Why is he telling them that? Because that's going to be a blessing and a curse. Shepherds and farmers don't get along. By the way, in the history of Israel, if you go back and look at it, if you look at a map of the country, we'll put Egypt down here, Sinai down here, Dead Sea, Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, sources of the Jordan. When you take a look at the land, the land actually has a spinal column of mountains that goes right down the center of it. And those mountains are the lands of the ites. The, the, all of the ites are shepherds, right? So let's say the right side are all shepherds. The left side, along the coast, where you get all this predictable rainfall, are farmers. And what's important is during the biblical period, the farmers were Philistines and the shepherds were Israelites. Today, the farmers are largely Israelis and the shepherds are Palestinians and they still don't get along. The sh shepherds and farmers never have gotten along in the land. They're opposite economies, they think differently. How does a farmer think differently than a shepherd? A farmer's stationary, a farmer's protective. A shepherd goes wherever you have to go next to keep new grass under the flock. So a farmer thinks in borders and fences. A shepherd thinks in open land. Watch the modern Middle Eastern conflict because a lot of it isn't about what you think it's about. It's not about ideology. It's about a way of thinking that comes from open land versus closed land. And so a lot of things are just conflicting and people feel like it's wrong. You're stopping me. Now, think about it for a minute. I'm going to go modern on you for a minute. If you put up a wall and keep me from moving, what does that do? How does the shepherd perceive a wall as a, as a, a statement of hostility pr imprisoning me? You have a wall cutting right through the West Bank right now. And it's the source of a lot of sore spot between Israelis and Palestinians, Israelis put up the wall because before the wall, they were, people were coming over and blowing up buses and blowing up malls. Once the wall went up, that stopped. Why? Because you couldn't get your munitions across the wall. But from the other side of the wall, Palestinians who are not used to walls and property and want to be able to move around say, it's all our land. You shouldn't be walling us off. And so what you end up with are two different ways of thinking. What I'm trying to get you to see is that these ways of thinking are something that it was important for, for Joseph to know, but it's also important in, in common speech even today. I think what's interesting is that when I look through this, what I see is that Joseph was the man who was abused by his family. 
Joseph was the man who was abused by so-called friends and people in authority, but now he has to rise to a level of taking over and being in charge. And that's not as easy as it sounds. He's got to deal with his family in a way that is sensitive and let them know important things. I think Joseph understood why Pharaoh's inner reaction to them might not be favorable based on their culture. And so let me just say it this way. I would put next to say the end of chapter 46, uh, the beginning of chapter 47, Joseph really shows himself to be a pretty good student of people. It's one of the things that comes from being beat up. Now, what's interesting is when they meet in chapter 47, you might get a wrong impression. Go to 47, verse 4 for a minute. Um, they said to Pharaoh, we have come to sojourn in the land for there is no pasture for your servants' flocks for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. And, and here's the thing. In learning to, to pivot, you have to read people well. Uh, you know what? I'm going to do this too fast and it's way too important for that. If there is a skill you can develop, if there is a skill every one of you needs to develop to be successful, learn how to read people. Learn how to read people. It's more important than learning how to read books. I don't care if you're illiterate, learn how to read people. Reading people is the difference between a good worship leader and a bad one. Two people can love God immensely and worship him intensely personally, but only one group, one guy can lead a group. Why? Because you've got to be able to read more than just music. You've got to be able to read people. Have you ever been in a room where you knew the person was talented musically, but they weren't pulling you in worship? It might be something's wrong in their heart, but more often than not, it's something's wrong in their ability to read people. And, and I'm telling you, one of, the, one of the things that Joseph learned through trouble was how to read people. Some of you haven't had a lot of trouble in your life, and you don't read people very well. It is a skill that people in companies will pay extra for. How many, of you, how many of you would say that some of your classmates are the kind of people that make you feel at ease? They're, that's just their personality. Anybody like that? Who's a, who's a make you feel at ease person? Anybody, do you not know each other yet? Why? What's, a, what's that? Are you saying Kirsten? Yeah? Are you a make people feel at ease person? Yeah? Um, some of you are inviting people. You're the kind of people that if, some, if, if, I'm, if I'm assigned a seat, I want it to be next to you. You're going to be the kind of person who naturally thinks of the people around them. Okay? Um, some of you are very, very, very task-oriented. Can I see the task-oriented people? I am one of you. Okay? Task-oriented people, I, rem I was out here hanging a bulletin board in the hallway, and I had my drill and my mollies and I'm going to hang this thing and I'm up there and I'm measuring and I'm trying to get it right and if you know anything about me you know all that would have to do to drive me absolutely insane was have it not be level okay that would just that would kill me I will I will tear the wall down and rebuild the wall before I will let it not be level okay and so I'm trying to get this thing right and a guy comes over and he says pastor can I talk to you now I'm, I'm telling you this honestly I'm not proud of this it was terrible but I'm just being straight with you and I'm standing there, and here's what's going on in my mind. Why? Because I don't look like I'm working right now? I'm doing something here. And it's at those moments you have to go, wait a minute. The bulletin board is not the ministry. The people are. But I'm a task guy. I can do task or people. I just can't do both at the same time. So my point is that one of the things you have to do is be able to read people well enough to understand um, I don't shop. I stink at shopping. I, I'm more of a hunter-gatherer. I go and I kill the meat and bring it home, OK? So if I'm looking for shirts, I'm not looking for pants. My wife scopes the store, gets the landscape, feels that maybe when I said I want to go looking for shirts, I might mean shoes or watches, because this looks good. And I'm like, I'm here for shirts. Beep, 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 shirts, lock on, you know. And if you actually catch me in shopping mode, 
you can walk right up and wave at me. I will not see you. Why? I'm looking for shirts. And if you're not a shirt, I'm not telling you that's good. I'm telling you, you need to know what your weaknesses are. And Joseph is well aware of what the weaknesses of his family are going to look like to the Egyptians, so he's coaching them. It sounds like um, Jacob, by the way, when he, go to verse 7, 47, 7 for a minute. I want you to see the actual meeting with Pharaoh for a minute, because there's a really great moment. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. Few and pleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my father lived during the days of his, their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. Tell me that doesn't sound like a whiny person. Very few years and very unpleasant. You know, it hasn't been a lot of good times. Is that what it, is that what it sounds like to you? It sounds like he's whining, but he's not. Hidden in the communication are the signs that he understood something about Pharaoh. Common to this day was that the length of one person's life showed their wisdom. And the more years of your life that you touted, the more wisdom you were claiming. So Jacob is very old. He's got a lot of years, but he doesn't want to boast. So if he just comes out and says, I've lived 130, it's going to sound like he's boasting. So he says, there's not that many. And what he's doing is he's making sure that the most honored in the room is Pharaoh. He's doing something here. Jacob entered, and he was much older than everybody else in the room, but Pharaoh offered him honor by asking, how many years do you have? Jacob showed respect. He showed loyalty, something that he failed to do while his dad was alive, by the way. He mentions his dad. But it's interesting that he would go back and remember the age of his father. Because you remember Jacob was lying to his dad the last time he saw his dad. So it's kind of a little bit of an emotional thing. What's interesting is he could recall his long deceased father and he could do it in, in a way that um, I think moved, moves you when you look at the story. Look, the other thing is you have to understand where people are coming from. And I think that Jacob and Joseph both learn where Pharaoh's coming from in this. Let me say it this way. I'll know you can read people well when you make what, how, where they're coming from more important than where you're coming from. As long as you're arguing to get them to see it your way, you're not understanding and you're not acting in a mature way. I'm not saying that there's not some time for persuasion. I'm saying get off the persuasion page because there's an awful lot of time people spend persuade, 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 persuade. Do you have any friends like that? I mean, well, acquaintances because you really would rather they not be friends. Do you have any folks that get onto social media just to grind the same point over and over and over? Because they actually think Facebook means poster. I'm going to have a poster of placard of protest. This is where I'm going to do it. And what do you do? Because I hide them. Occasionally I go back and look, but mostly I hide them. Why? Because they're annoying. They don't understand the social situation that we're in. How many of you know people that expose way too many details online? How many of you know things about people you wish you didn't know, but they told you? Learning to read people is also learning to know when to hold back the cards. Okay. Now, in verse 4, I think if you have a forthright request, one of the things you learn in life is learn how to say what it is you're saying. Um, <laughs> that sounds weird. People say when they go in the Oval Office, there's actually a syndrome of people who walk into the Oval Office, and they are so thrown off by being in the place of the president that they stammer and can't talk and can't ask for what they're there for. And in any given day, the president receives several people that don't actually ask him for what they're there for because they can't talk. It, that's weird, right? Do you know people who can't tell you what it is they're trying to tell you? I, I'm in whole conversations and I walk away and go, what did we just agree to? I have no idea what that was all about. You don't know that that happens more often than not. I walk around going, I don't know what that was about, actually. Here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 4. They said to Pharaoh, we've come here to sojourn in the land. There's no pasture for your servant's flock, for famine is severe in the land of Canaan. <coughs> now, therefore, please let your servants live in the land of Goshen. They asked. One of the impressive things that Joe learned from the obstacle course of life was to be straightforward and ask for what you're asking for. 
I'm going to tell you I'm one of those guys who don't take hints. So if you're going to be late and you want to tell me that, don't beat around the bush, just tell me. I think one of the things that happens is our hints make things opaque that should be clear. Let me go to verses uh, 5 and 6 for a second. And can I just make the, the point that we have, to, we have to practice respectful obedience that accepts direction? Pharaoh gave them a specific place to live, and Joe complied with the order specifically. I see that in verses 5 and 6. I saw, also see it in 11. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your fathers, your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Verse 11, Joseph settled his father and brothers and gave them possession of the land of Egypt in the best of the land. He did exactly what he was told. <coughs> There's a reason Pharaoh trusted Joseph. What he said, Joseph did. If you're going to remake the rules behind your boss's back, your boss isn't going to trust you. That's what's going to happen. And, and, and I think some of the detail here is helpful. Obedience sets up a platform for blessing. We see it over and over in the Bible. Obedience sets up a platform for blessing. Now, get down to verse 6. I think one of the things that also we have to rely on is a constructed testimony. Look at verse 6. Pharaoh speaking. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. If you know any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. It's interesting. That trust was built and earned for the last dozen years. It's interesting that Joe was asked, who among your brothers do you trust? Does anybody else see some irony there? You know, the ones that sold you into slavery, but Pharaoh doesn't know that. Why doesn't he know? Because Joseph didn't feel it was necessary to tell stories that defamed his brothers in front of Pharaoh. See, when you defame, when you don't cover with love, the opportunities decrease, they don't increase. You got a problem with somebody, keep it to yourself. You share it with five other people, and then five other people are wounded by your problem. I think what's interesting is as you close off this section, you get down to, to say, the middle of the, of the chapter. I, I love that Joseph provided, verse 12, for his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. I love that life can leave you better or bitter. I love that handling trouble means that you become more sensitive for other people. How many of you have seen the YouTube videos that are floating around of the, of the guys that go up and they ask for something from a homeless person who's more than willing to help them? They ask from somebody who's obviously got life together and they're not. I think sometimes when you get beat down, you get more sensitive to what life is really about. I think when your life has been broken up, let me stop and say it this way. Before we go past the middle of the chapter, one of the dangers of being one of the good kids that grew up in the good home that had the good resources is you can become very hardened. Mercy fleets from the person who's successful. Mercy isn't a main character that's developed in the successful. We tend to develop responsibility better than mercy. Can I have you develop both? Yes. A person's responsible to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but not everybody can. And so mercy fills in the gap between responsibility and the unsuccessful life. And what we have to be able to do is, is understand that we're wasting our life if we're holding back our life from getting involved in other people's lives. We're wasting our life. Um, John Maxwell, in one of his books, Developing the Leader Within You, said, a study of 300 highly successful people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Helen Keller, Winston Churchill, Albert Schweitzer, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Albert Einstein, revealed that one-fourth had handicaps such as blindness, deafness, or crippled limbs. Three-fourths had either been born in poverty, came from broken homes, or at least came from exceedingly tense and disturbed situations. Three-quarters of the people that were incredibly successful came from what you would call a bad situation. That means one quarter came from what you would call a good situation. Why? Because I think people that come from a bad one learn that trouble in life develops them and it can sensitize and soften them. Nobody wants to be pounded on, but that's the only way to make the meat tender. 
So that's what happens. Okay, let's go past that one. I'm trying to get you through to the end of the book. I want to take a moment at the middle of 47 and uh, through 48 and 49 to go from adoptions and blessings. This is one of those passages that honestly, <coughs> you, unless you understand why it's important, you will kind of go wah, 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 wah. It won't mean anything. But in 47, you have some adoptions that take place. And I want to take some snapshot views of what's going on in the life of Israel and his family. Now, when we're, when we're not cut off from blessing, we can get the, uh, the impression that life is good and therefore God loves us more. But when we are cut off from blessing, we should learn that God, it's not because God doesn't love us. It's that he told us that there's an effect in the world that comes from a cause. We have to relate the two together. There was, in a very real way, a famine in all the world so God could put his people in the right place. Do, do you see that? God literally disrupted the lives of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, so that he could get Jacob where he needs him. Do you believe that God could change an entire country's uh, attitudes and move things around in order to get a group of believers to do what he asked them to do? I've got a story right here that says he does. I, I think that with a voice of tenderness that's found in a broken father's heart, I can hear Jacob warning He's not a Puritan. He's not angry. But a father that's connected to his own cause and effect in life. I want to take Jacob to an elderly part of his life. What have you learned about this guy? Is, is this guy an honest, upstanding guy? Well, yeah, except for when he's not. Does, does Jacob have the ability to have great confidence that he's done it right when it comes to raising kids? Does he have a, you know what, you come from our family, it's a, it's a family rooted in integrity. Can he say that? Eh, not really. Actually, Jacob could probably say, you know, coming from our family makes you really good at wheeling and dealing. We got Laban, we got, Ma, we got Rebecca, Mama, we got all kinds of things in my life that, that I look back on and I see all my failures. Listen. I want to tell you about a, sto a story about a guy who was raised in a religious home. It was in a home where they followed a God of rules more than a God of grace and love. His name was Hugh Hefner, and he would later publish a pornographic magazine, Playboy magazine. He was asked a question once about what his parents were like, and this was his response. He told of how he'd been raised in a Puritan home of religious tradition. His parents believed in God, but not a God of grace, love, and compassion. Theirs was a rigid religion. They never told Hefner or his brother that they loved him, and his mother never kissed him because she didn't want them to get germs. So Hefner set out to find love wherever he could. He went to indicate that his dad was remote. He went on and said that he was not very engaging, and while he looked hard, at, at, at his father, he said, you know, dad really did provide a good home, but there was almost no interaction and no physical touch in my home. Hugh Hefner recalled how his parents had given him a blanket when he was a child as a security blanket. He painted a vivid picture of a little boy going to bed at night, hugging his blanket, the only thing that he had to hug, the only thing that returned any warmth. The blanket was bordered by bunny rabbits, and they became his bunny blanket follow this. Hafner went on to recount as a boy, he always wanted a puppy, but his parents said dogs spread germs and there couldn't be one in the house. It was only after they discovered a tumor in his ear, one that could be detrimental to his hearing, that his parents broke down and bought Hefner a dog. No one could have predicted, however, that the dog would unexpectedly die after just five days. Hugh Hefner recalled how he wrapped the dying dog in his bunny blanket as a means to comfort the puppy. But when the puppy died, his mother buried the dog and the blanket. Both sources of his deepest comfort were suddenly gone. He said, matter-of-factly, I guess I'm still just that little boy trying to find love. I wanted you to hear that because people fall down because they don't connect cause and effect. They don't realize that what happens to them in their life charts the course of their life unless they allow God to move it. 
They don't understand how hardness toward God can play out in their lives. They set up their own sinful patterns, and when they begin to yield bondage and death, they blame God for the circumstances. God, why am I here? Well, listen, he just did these five things that led you there. It can happen to people, and it can happen to whole nations. Listen to me. Our country is making decisions now that your children will reap like a whirlwind problems that they cannot untie. The more kids that grow up in a house that don't know what a man or a woman is, the more kids that don't grow up in a house that knows what a marriage is, the more kids that grow up in brokenness, the more of them that grow up thinking that if a baby's inconvenient, you can just kill it. The more of them that grow up in an immoral situation which is restyled into a morality, the more warped they will be. And you say, but my kids won't. No, but all the other kids on the playground will be. The ones your kid are going to marry will be. And you're going to warn them, but they're not going to hear you. How do I know? Because you're not listening to your parents about who to date, are you? So my point is, People are not going to connect the dots between the rising of social services budgets and the rising of problems that go along with all of the medical issues of our day. They're not going to connect that back to social policies. I'm going to tell you that my generation ruined marriage by making no-fault divorce cheap. So it was cheaper to throw away your marriage than to fix it. And as a result, your generation decided, well, what's marriage anyway? Why? Because we made it cheap to throw it away. When you take something that's important and make it cheap, you change its value in the eyes of the culture. Now we can kick God out of our public square and we can mock him in public education and replace the creator with primordial ooze and communicate on our airwaves a whole series of equal rights tolerance uh, that, that trashes our own real truth values. But bottom line is, as with a nation, so goes a child. There, you have to connect the dots between the compromise here and the fruits of the compromise there. I'm not saying it to get you depressed. I'm saying it because you can't suit up and actually deal with anything unless you can identify what it is. There's a reason the guy you date shows up all the time late and thinks that's okay. Um, in the early stage of developing a young child, the boy who doesn't learn to clean up his toys is the one who shows up on the job without his tools. There, there's a direct correlation with how we raise them and what they come out being. If it wasn't the case, you wouldn't need parents. You could just do it on your own. So the Bible says that with both a loud voice of the bearded prophets long ago and with the tender and shaky voice of an old dying man like Jacob, he says life is connected, causes and effects. 